was the Norse or Viking graveyard. There's roughly about 15 to 20,000 people buried in here. And of course, the Norse word is long dead, but the English for it is a fantastic word, the deadery. What a name for a cemetery, huh? Mm. The deadery. My one thought apart from, this is brilliant, is Wexford has everything that this place has. And I just thought it would be a shame not to use the historical sites here in Wexford that we've been to tonight. Yeah. Like Patrick's Church, St. John's Graveyard, and of course, St. Scrabby, which is our backdrop here tonight. Here's Hello, everyone. Today is Friday, the 7th of October, and the circus is in town. You can see there's Tom Duffy's Circus. But that's not what we're going to do today. Good evening. I'm here at the start of where the Haunted Hollow Tour will begin at 8 o'clock. I'm going to show you little snippets of it. And then tonight, at the end of it, I'll show you um, a little interview we have with the owner who started it and the, the genius behind it, uh, Paul Walsh. He's also a, runs a tour during the daytime called Wex Walks. And we'll tell, tell you all about that. So stay with me and see what I have in store for you. <laughs> Guys, you're very welcome on a Wex Walk and the first inaugural Wex Walk Haunted Hallows Tour. Ooh. I did this for my friends last week and they were very, very horrifically shook at the end of it. So hopefully you'll be the very same. So what I'll do tonight is a mixture of my normal tour and then of course the paranormal side of Wexford, which we're on way through here, was the Norse or Viking graveyard. There's roughly about 15 to 20,000 people buried in here. And of course the Norse word is long dead. But the English for it is a fantastic word, the deadery. What a name for a cemetery, huh? Mm. The deadery. And this house just behind us here, Ivy Cottage. That was built in 1888. And Ivy Cottage, my friends, even though it's much smaller, will give lots of all a run for its haunted image any day of the week. So Ivy Cottage is over there. It's in the same family since it was built. They've had several hauntings in that house. One of the famous ones is the old lady. So the old lady can be seen in any of these windows here. And if you see the old lady, it's bad news, something's gonna happen in your family. So if you want to look up into the windows, spoilers, something's gonna happen. <laughs> There's also cries that come from the garden back there. Some people say it sounds like a fox. Some people say it sounds like a whale. Of course, the old family that were there, O'Donoghue's, anyone would know, goes back to the Banshee. So a lot of people back in the day would equate that place with the Banshee's house or the Banshee's street. So we're literally standing in a town, this Paranormal 101, and me being the nice guy that I am, decided to meet you in the beating black heart of Haunted Wexford. You're welcome. Okay, so we just started the tour. We're going to be walking through the town and to go into the different graveyards. Um, hopefully we get to see something really spooky. Uh, stay with me and I'll show you little snippets. Like I said, I'm not going to show the whole video because I want to keep some of it a secret to you. So if you're ever in Wexford, make sure you, uh, you look up. The link will be below for uh, Wex Walks. Uh, there's day tours and evening tours available. Okay, so just gather up after all here, guys, at the back. Lovely. So we've just walked down Peter Street, and of course Peter Street here was one of the original Viking names. As I always say, there's a heart to a Viking town. Of course the Bull Ring is a heart, the Dead Ring is a heart, and from these there's never other streets. They're what I call the dark veins of Wexford, and that's these lawns or lanes. And everybody knows if you tried to drive through Wexford, it's like a demolition derby, isn't it? Mm. Because of the size of the streets. <laughs> that's just the way it was. And when I was a kid, for those of you who are of my vintage, you probably remember when the main street was two lane traffic and they parked either side of the road. And no, it wasn't any bigger than it is now. I don't know how anyone did it. But the reason I stop here is just before we go up to our first churchyard. If you look down here, where Uncle Sam's used to be, you go down there to Harper's Lane. Now, Harper's Lane has a different name in Wexford, which most things do. For the last 100 years, nobody calls that Harper's Lane. People call that Cinema Lane. For the simple reason, back in the day before the big huge audience and all that, all the towns in Ireland had their own independent cinemas who usually showed different films from each other. That street was no different. Right in a row, believe it or not, folks, there was three different cinemas. One, two, three, all in a row, five pence each for the night. And you would go in and watch the different films and the kids would go back and forward and see different things for the night. Cheap entertainment. Now, this is St. Patrick, so I told you about the ratings, guys. This one is actually the orange rated one. That it <laughs> So a couple of things about this graveyard, guys. First one is this grave here. I don't want to say the name of the family. I asked when I tell the story. 
family had no problem with me telling the story I did agree to leave the name off you can't see it anyway because of this tree now this goes back to a very very old tradition so in Ireland of course back in the day people 100% agree and believe in all sorts of creatures and one of the major ones here in Ireland as it was in the whole of Europe is vampires and when somebody dies a tragic death like someone in this family died in childbirth so childbirth suicide murder things like that they believe that you came back and that you came back as a revenant or a vampire and you feasted on flesh or on bone or on blood something very unsavory so what did they do about it so in this case the family actually planted a yew tree because what they believed was that the tree would actually hold the person down and it wouldn't be able to get out so if you ever see that in Edinburgh, I know somebody said earlier on <coughs> that being in Edinburgh, in all the Kirk Yards there, there's trees and lots of graves. There's one here and it's on this. And still some people believe you can hear a female voice singing around this grave. So maybe she's singing up through the tree, I don't know. But this church here? here behind you guys, this is St. Patrick's Church. I think it's one of Ireland and Wexford's most beautiful buildings. It's great to have it open in the public again. And before I tell you more about the church, just this tree behind Mick. Yep. So the biggest grave in here, guys, starts at that tree and goes all the way down the wall. And believe it or not, that uh, grave over there, which is an unmarked grave for some reason, which I'm fighting with the council about currently, which I think should be marked, has 2,156 people in it. It's one of the biggest mass graves in Ireland. And that all comes from the night that Cromwell came to Wexford Town. So we know he famously came to Drogheda, levelled it. There's nothing in Drogheda older than 1649. Nothing, not even a tree. He destroyed the place. Then he came down the coast and he wanted to take Wexford or Waterford. He looked at Hookhead, which is in Wexford, Crookhead and Waterford, and famously said, I'll take the papists by hook or by crook. People still say it today. Mm -hmm. He chose Wexford. They came and they put all 15 cannon on the piece of wall by the art centre, funny enough, next, <laughs> right next to this lovely new building mm -hmm. there. That's where they broke the wall. At the same time, a man called Richard Stafford was paid to open the gate, up in the fight. So the English soldiers piled in on top of Wexford and they were ordered by Cromwell to slaughter every man, woman, child and beast they came across. They did it without prejudice. They did it without mercy. Anybody on the streets that night were killed. So in a town of 5,000 people, in one night, he killed 2,156 people. It's almost half. In the 12 days he was in Wexford, Countywide, he killed three and a half thousand people out of ten thousand people. So a third of the county, just because he could. Not a really nice guy, our Cromwell. So do you know Penny's on the main street? Yeah. When you walk by Penny's the next time, look up over the shop because you'll see the small windows. There's about twelve windows up above. That's actually a standing Tudor house. It's one of the last. I said there's only about nine of them left in Ireland. So it dates back to the fifteen thirties. Top. From Hoare's side in, one, two, three, that was Cromwell's bedroom for the 12 days he was in Wexford. And on the key side of the building, there's a window in the very same place. And there's an old wife's tale in Wexford that every Friday morning you can hear a voice with a Cornish accent shout out orders. And that's meant to be Cromwell. And he's still around here. Wouldn't surprise me. Mm. Do you know what they did to him? The English? Anyone know what they did to Cromwell? 39 years after he died? This is how much they loved him in his own country. Christmas. Go on. Did he cancelled Christmas. Yeah. He cancelled Easter. Yeah. He banned gravy. Yeah. I would have killed, I would have killed oh, him, have yeah, killed him just for that, to be honest. Yeah. So, 39 years after he died, they dug him up as a corpse, put him on trial, gave him a lawyer, found him guilty of treason, hung Drew and quartered him, and put his head on Traitor's Gate in uh, the Tower of London, where it was for 180 years, his own people. So, you know you're not nice. One of the famous ghosts in this graveyard, guys, actually comes from that door behind Kevin. <laughs> Walks all the way across here, oh, all the way through the side of the refectory, and out that opening over there, which would have been the rich people's entrance into the church back in medieval times. Now she's the grey lady, and an awful lot of people will say that that's Isabel de Clare, and apparently she has a bowl in her hands. Now that goes back to another old sort of illusion. Her dad, Dermot McMurr, was the King of Leinster. Of course, Strongbow came to help him get his kingdom back under the understanding he got the daughter. And once uh, Dermot McMurr was dead, he'd get the titles. And there's a really, really old rumour that goes right back to the 1200s that they actually poisoned him with mushroom soup. That there weren't nice mushrooms, let's say. And that he died in agony. And a lot of people think that woman who runs through here with the ball is Isabel de Clare, still repeating that horrible act. When you get to where I am, this is literally like a cross-cut of Irish history. 
So the smallest rocks that you've gone by there that have no names on them, they're 12, 13, 14th century graves. Then the small square ones, they're 15th century graves. The ones that start round at the top are 17th century graves. And then anything with a cross on it is 18th century. And all the iron crosses, and you'll see them again when we're in John's graveyard, they got really popular in the 1850s all around the world. And of course they were built in Wexford in Pierce's foundry. And it was actually one of the reasons the Pierce's foundry became a huge rich, rich factory. That for about 30 years, they were the most popular gravestones for rich people in the world. But then of course, they started to rust. And they don't look as nice when they rust. So they went out of fashion after that. But you can see that. So guys, here we are on High Street. A couple of stories about here. One is about the coach, the bower, the dead coach. So in Irish folklore, all the old Irish family, so anyone with a Mac, anyone with a Y at the end of their name, anyone with a No at the start of their name, anyone who's an old, old family, like I'm half Carty, you go, when you're going to the other side, the coach, the bower calls to your house. So the coachman on the coach, the bower is a headless horseman. He calls to your door, he calls out your name, and you get in. If you don't go with him at that moment in time, that's where ghosts come from. That's the old thing, but he, he will not come back for you. So you have a choice to either go to whatever your fate is or stay on the mortar coil forever and a day. That's the way the old tradition is. Now, the opera house behind you here. Fantastic building. Uh, of course, at the moment, they're rehearsing for all the operas in there that are about to kick off in a couple of weeks. <coughs> but before this was here, and again, if you're of a certain vintage, you probably remember the Theatre Royal. And the Theatre Royal was built there in the 1700s. It was an all privately owned uh, theatre, about 500 seats in it, very old fashioned but very very beautiful and of course like any old theatre it has a theatre ghost mm -hmm. so if you're in the musicals like a lot of us here are and there's people here for musicals and plays and all the rest of it when you go in the stage door when you go out the stage door you have to say hello Johnny or goodbye Johnny if you're in there and you curse you have to say sorry Johnny and if you're in there on a Sunday you're fake because he doesn't like people being there on Sunday so it turns out Johnny is the original caretaker of the Theatre Royal. John Doyle died upstairs when he was cleaning the steps one day. And uh, if you break in his room as a person, about being in there on Sunday, being there after 11 o'clock at night, or not saying hello or goodbye, something will happen to you. So when the schools did the Miserable the first time in 2002 or 3, they were in the Theatre Royal here, and someone kicked over a tin of yellow paint, smart man, actually, right? And uh, of course it was, and he refused to apologise. All the lights on stage went off, just went, and there was silence. And in the dark, you could just hear him going, I'm so sorry, Johnny. <laughs> and then all the lights came back on again, but he's in there. And one other ghost that comes along here is a young girl. She's a 1798 ghost. Uh, we did, uh, Liz asked uh, myself and a, a group of people to do some monologues in the summer. And Tom O'Leary, who's my friend, actually wrote one based on this old legend that there's a servant guard and she's still looking for her brother that went missing in 1798 and then she calls house to house and then she's crying so she comes down this street and apparently at midnight you're not meant to answer the door because it'll be her that happened on that street that's where Tom wrote that so guys here we are in Rose Street car park you probably know the old story during the day this is very much a glorious story where I talk about the building of these two churches is a marvel which they were the whole idea of having twin churches in one town is fantastic the idea that it would have been at either end of town, which is hilarious to us now because one is here and one's in Bright Street. That was the size of the town at the time. It goes to show you how much bigger towns get over time as well. They're both city centre now. But there's a dark fact behind this that I obviously don't tell on the daytime one. This guy behind me here, this is Canon James Roach. Now these were very much his baby. He was the head priest in the town. In the whole parish, in fact, he was the boss man. There was no two ways about it. So he taught the friary, which was the main parish church, which was too small, which was probably true. So these were his dream. Now there was one problem. He started to build these churches in the 1840s. So I hope by saying that you start to see the problem. So in the middle of the Irish famine, this guy decides rather than take that money and give it to people who might need it, he went ahead with his ego plan here, right? I have no problem with these churches, they're beautiful. Bad timing, right? So he would literally go to every house on a Friday night, his altar boys would go around and they would get Roach's penny. Doesn't seem like a lot of money today, but back in the day, a penny is a huge portion of your wages. it will probably be about 30 or 40 euros today. It's something you'd miss. And they used to go around and that happened from the 1840s right up to the 1960s, but particularly in the 1840s, a lot of people would sort of 
question his morality about that. Even I would a little bit, I do think these are lovely, but people were literally dying in the streets and he decided to build two absolutely massive churches. So, for that reason, a lot of people don't think that this man can rest properly. So when you come through here, sorry Kevin, I know you come through here the whole time. Some yeah. people say that that head follows you. And there's pictures online where he's looking down that way. There's pictures where he's looking up the steps. And there's actually a picture where he's looking all the way back at the houses over there. That head's coming off. That head's coming off. <laughs> be like the Simpsons, you can cut the head off the statue. It looks like he's looking towards Catholics at the moment. So, but so, like yeah. <laughs> so when, when you go inside the chapel, his mausoleum is just inside there. There's a big white coffin, basically, he's on top of it. A lot of people, when you say you touch that, that it's preternaturally cold. And again, that's a sign that he's not resting properly. So try that when you go in there and I leave that up to yourselves. So this graveyard, guys, this is St. John's. This is a yellow level. There has been, this is the place where orbs and cold spots happen mostly, uh, rather than apparitions or anything like that. But even though St. Patrick's has the big church, to be honest with you, this one is my preferred graveyard because it really is a slice of history. So before I go into any stories, if you look behind you here, you can literally see every type of grave. So again, you see 12th, 13th century stones. Then you see tombs from the 15th, 16th century. Then the huge 17th and 18th century uh, stones over here. And then the crosses from the late 18th, to early 19th century. I'll tell you a couple of stories about them as we go along. Now there would have been a church in here. There was a church in all of them. The church is just behind me here. So if you can imagine guys, the church was just on this space here. And it was actually the first church in Wexford to have a spire. And it was dedicated to both saints, uh, John and St. Bridget. And it burned down sometime in the 1540s. There's an old legend that this guy broke out of jail and he was a famous robber. And that he kidnapped a young girl and they went into the church and people tried to burn them out and they went too far and the whole church burned down. Now we don't know if that's true or not. It's a bit of a legend, but it's as good a reason as any, I suppose, because there's literally, you can see, there's not even a foundation left around here as we go along. So now, this grave here, guys, says, here lies Anthony Laffin, who departed this life, October 16th, 1798. So Anthony Laffin was wounded in the Battle of Wexford in 1798 in the stomach. The uh, wound actually didn't kill him straight out, but a series of infections took care of him later on in his life. Now, Instrumental in the United Irishmen at the time was a man called Richard Monaghan. He's also known as Dick Monk, and Monk Street is named after him. And believe it or not, folks, McGee's over here where I'm shining my light at the minute. That was his pub back in the day. And he's buried in this churchyard. Now, because he was killed by the British, the uh, Wexford people got his body back and certainly buried him with honours, but didn't give him a gravestone for the simple reason they were afraid his body would be taken up so his head would go on a pike. Mm -hmm. So. This guy here is Dick Monk's best friend. That's Dick Monk's pub. Dick Monk's family were born over here. And underneath my feet right here, there's a grave with one man in it. Now I would bet every penny in my wallet that's Dick Monk. I really would. Because why would the Irish leave him somewhere he wouldn't be remembered? Now if you look behind you here guys, and I'll bring you down in a second. This mausoleum here. Ooh. This is the Talbot Redmond mausoleum. You can see there, it looks lovely and like something out of a horror tale. It's like someone put it there for me, but they didn't. So if anybody doesn't know, the Talbot family, of course, the Talbot Hotel is theirs and the whole chain. They're actually the Earls of Shrewsbury in England. So if you know Alton Towers. Oh, no. <laughs> yeah. what there was it, goes. it was a cat, was it? That was a bird. There's a bird. <laughs> <laughs> a hunted bird. We're charging extra for that. <laughs> you have pants for sale, Paul. Yeah, 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 yeah. <laughs> Just have cats and just put them up trees here all day. So the Earls of Shrewsbury made this in the 1830s. And of course, they married into the Redmond family. And the Redmond family are even older than the Earls of Shrewsbury. They were the original Norman Lords of Wexford. The original name was Rameau, and it changed to Redmond over the years. And the most famous man that's buried in there is an MP called John Edward Redmond. So if you walk down here with me. I have a bit of a dare for you. I have a dare for you. So this is the Talbot Redmond Mausoleum. There's about 20 bodies in there. Uh, John Edward Redmond, the MP for Wexford and Waterford, is one of them. Of course, his biggest claim to fame is when Charles Stuart Parnell had his affair and had to leave the Home Rule Party. This was the man who took over. He was hugely powerful in Westminster. The Whigs and the Tories basically had the same amount of seats in the House of Commons. So John Redmond's nine seats became all powerful. So for the Tory Prime Minister to get his way, he needed John Redmond. 
So any train station, any port, any large road that was built at the time, you have this guy to thank for it. Now, when World War One broke out, his whole idea of home rule got put on charge. I always said to the kids on the tour, if World War One hadn't happened, John Edward Raymond would have been the Prime Minister of a free state. It'd be in all the history books and everybody would know who he is. But it didn't happen. World War One broke out. So he's been largely forgotten. But he did do an awful lot of good in his day. However, his famous quote, which I'm sure you know, you might not know it was him, was when it was taken off the table, he was asked by the English to speak to the Irish men who weren't going to be conscripted for obvious reasons. He was asked to convince the people of Ireland to go and fight in World War One, which he did. And it's the big black spot on his copybook. And of course, his famous line was, don't worry lads, you'll be home by Christmas. Now, and now we the are. last story I'll tell you in here, can everybody see this grave here? Yeah. So again, we're going back to vampire lore for a minute. Again, I've asked the family permission to tell the story. I've promised them I won't use the name. So suicide victims back in the day were prone uh, victims to become vampires. That was the way the old lore used to go. So this poor unfortunate soul uh, went in quite a bad way. And you can see here over the years, rumors started to persist that a man was seen here at night roaming the graveyard and people in the houses opposite back in the 18th century felt that they were sick. So what would often happen, you can see some of the 12th century tombstones here have actually been taken and used as ballast weight. They were put on top of the grave to keep people down. Now again, guys, I cannot reiterate enough the difference between Irish vampires and Twilight or anything like that. Mm. Even after Revenant was, the Revenant time was right over, our vampires are a much more bestial thing. They eat your flesh, they don't just drink your blood. It's not a little mark. You don't come back as another one or anything like that. You are food. That's mm. the way that Irish vampires operate. They often are in graveyards, or one of the other things to do is they stay in bogs or they stay in rivers and wait for somebody to come for water and pull them in. And that's a really old tradition. But if you ever see a grave like that anywhere, mm. that means it comes from that old tradition. Mm. Just saying. So the tour so far is really entertaining. Paul has a lot of stories. So I would suggest that you uh, take the time to come to Wexford and look up Wex Walks and take one of Paul's tours. They're very informative and he has a good way of telling stories. Uh, before I go into this, I have to apologize in advance to Liz because Liz is the artistic director of Wexford Art Centre. Kevin, I'm really sorry for what I'm about to do with the tour. Yeah, but there you go. So, well, look, I know there's ghosts in here. Yeah, so do I. This, this is where I had my, my one and only supernatural experience uh, for real. So behind you here, guys, this is Wexford Art Centre. This is venue, one of the best venues in Ireland. Hope you all come to see our shows here and everything that's on. Opening next Thursday. Opening next Thursday for Wexford Drama for production of Women on the Verge of HRT. So uh, this place here, guys, long before uh, it was ever an art centre, this area is called Corn Market. So the art centre was the Corn Market. And if you look at the building here, you'll see the evidence of that. So where the windows are now and where the door is here currently, they were all open arches and back in medieval times and up into the 18th century you'd come along with your cart with your 50 sheep on it or your 300 bottles of wine it was all weighed and judged in there you paid some tax and then you were allowed to come into Wake Street here you would have come through the gate you would have been on Jan's Gate Street just by the library there into town and then down into the place to sell as much as you like now because of the central position this became not only the council buildings it also became the courthouse here in Wake Street and literally if you were sentenced to death there was no such thing as going onto that row for six or eight months. The minute you were sentenced to death, out you went into the small backyard in here and you were home. So back in the 1990s when they were doing renovations here, they found bones out in the yard. They also found human bones upstairs in the supper room here. About three human skeletons, so that place is literally full of the dead. Now apart from that, there's also a caretaker here. He's not nearly as benevolent a figure as Johnny was. And I've actually been on his hands. So the caretaker that's in here uh, goes back to the early 1900s. They used to have dances here. He famously hated them. He had a small little cupboard that he used to sit in just outside the theater. The door's still there for it. Uh, or was there last time? It's still, there, still yeah. there. So uh, up on top of the stairs. And one night people went out just thinking he was in there to sleep. And the next day when they came in, his dead body was found. He had died on site. So he's not actually a visual ghost. Often if people are here too late, I've experienced this myself you feel like you're physically walking into something that you can't walk through, like a very strong man or a very strong sort of beast here on the stairs. So we were building a set for a play called Antigone inside in the supper room in here, or the pillar room inside. 
And if anyone knows uh, how a unit saw works, you know the way it goes down, so you can cut down into wood. So there's two clasps on it, they're screwed on. So a head cannot come off one of those saws. The head from our saw flew across the arts and twice. So something unscrewed that saw twice. And threw it across. We were listening to the news for the shop of hearts. So this is called down the street. And we had a small little CD player back in the day. It was written here in 2002. And it kept on being physically put off. All the time. I plugged out early, early, and you actually had to press a button to turn it off. And we could hear it clicking off. And when we came out, our friend Danielle. So everyone knows Danielle who knows me. And I'll tell any lies here. She actually physically bumped into somebody and said sorry. And when she looked up, there was nobody there. So after that day, we were always a little bit more careful of my extra dark centers. Best of luck, please. <laughs> so I do the history before I do the mystery, guys. This whole area is called Selskar. Now, Selskar is an ancient Norse word for seal rock. So all the clips that would have been all the way around this area were absolutely populated to the last with seals. The Vikings loved that because they ate the meat, they used the oil to burn, and the skin for their waterproofs when they went on their journeys. So because of that, they started the town here, worked their whole way up to Barrick Street, put the wooden wall in place here behind you, which was then transformed into this stone wall by the Normans from 1170 to 1250. And as I say, guys, the closer we get to the gate, the higher the wall will get. And before we go through the last remaining gate into medieval Wexford, you'll see how big it was, how impressive it was, because the whole wall would have been like that once upon a time. Now, just be mindful, guys, the further we get towards Selsk Abbey, and I will give you the full warning because i have to when we're outside south scrabby this whole area is absolutely riddled with stories i could actually do 45 minutes here if i wanted to right and all the ghost stories are about the place of course there's ghost archers that are meant to appear on the top of the towers there's ghost women that are meant to appear in the small slit windows asking to get out there's meant to be men that run across the grass here and then they disappear through the uh through the hedges there uh there's so many stories and when we get up closer to selsker I tell you some really good ideas and when we get into sales screw as well there's obviously some really good stories some very important stories when we get into there so from now on in guys just stick with your accountability buddy please do and as i say before we get the sales scrabby i'll give you the full 411 on what's happening and if you decide you don't want to come in then you can wait outside for us it's a short stop but it's a hard stop and stop so we'll see what happens when we get there <laughs> guys we'll just see. just before we go into our very scary area a little bit more history so this behind us here <coughs> This is Selsker Gate and Selsker Tower. It's the only remaining gate in the medieval Wexford. Gives you a really good idea of what the town wall would have been like. It's at its full 29 feet here. This would have had a huge iron gate. And pretty much where you're standing right now is where the Norman invasion of Ireland really kicked off back in 1170. Strongbow came to Waterford. As it burned, he got married to Aoife. And when they came to Wexford, they didn't want the town to burn. So the Vikings opened the gates. He was brought in as a conquering hero. And of course the Concordia was signed. He and Dermot McMurray were the Lords of Leinster and that was 700 years of being under the Norman slash English rule. It all kind of happened here, not with any sort of brave heart moment, but with the signing of a document and the quaffing of wine. So if you come in here, so if you can imagine guys, big iron gate, that would have been opened. So if you walk on through with me, you're a medieval Wexford. Now here on the wall it says Westgate Tower. That was a mistake, it was made in the early 90s. This oh. is Selsker Tower. Westgate Tower would have been down on the street there, it would have gone at an angle over by Westgate uh, pub and it would have connected onto that wall and then all that would have been left here was cliff front beyond that so it was very very safe to live in Wexford. So behind you says Scrabby which I'll bring you into in a second. So a lot of people believe there's no actual writing evidence because the Vikings didn't write it down. There's a long standing legend or folklore that this is built on the site of a Viking temple. And that Viking temple was to both Wotan and Thor, who were two of the big gods, of course, the, the head god of the Norse uh, mythology, and Thor, who we all know as the god of thunder, who was extremely popular then, just like he is now. And then on that site, they built this compound. So this was all finished here by the year 1250. There are some sort of back and forth on when exactly it opened. Some people say 1190. Some people say it wouldn't have been possible to build it in that quick amount of time from 1170 on. But let's just say for for argument's sake, it's all finished and done here by 12.50. You St. Mary's Church, that will be in in a minute. Then you have the Basilica of St. Peter and Paul here in the middle, which is where the monks would have stayed. 
and then the last bit of the building down there that's what they call the spike that was built in 1826 it was an attempt to get more protestant people to come to church in wexford so saint iberius was full every sunday they decided to try and revamp south scrabby but they didn't like it they thought it was too catholic looking and they didn't come here so it sat there until 1964 when rates came in on roofs on the town and then the vicar ripped off the roof and he sold the roof and the organ and the church bell for five pounds. Be careful on the steps. Steps are about a thousand years old. Every bit of footing, just keep your torch down, guys, all right? See, let's go back here, right to the year 800 AD when the Vikings first showed up. On the site of the abbey here, this is where the temple would have been most likely. And here we have lots of Catholic and Protestant graves. If you look up high here, where you see that small bridge that goes all the way across, one of the old ghost stories about this place <coughs> is that a series of headless or not headless monks but faceless monks cows up, walk across here, right past that tree, and even though the bridge doesn't go that far anymore, they still go through that blue door and the Westgate building just behind you here. So if you follow me down here a little bit more in a second. What we have in here as well, guys, for anyone who doesn't know, buried in here are two Knights Templar. The Knights Templar, of course, were two things. They were the military wing of the Catholic Church. They were also the world's first banks. And a lot of people actually reckon they didn't worship Jesus at all. They actually worshiped John the Baptist. They thought the Christians had got it wrong. Now, this is a long-standing rumor, as I said. We never know this is what the Pope said about them, and that's why they were all executed later in their life. Some people think that's just because they wanted the Templar's money. But it is said that the Templar Church in Hook, which is right opposite the Templar Inn, that's one of the places that the uh, Templars kept the head of John the Baptist when it left the Holy Land. And that when it left that church, that's when all the bad stuff started to happen on the hook and why it currently hosts Wexford and Ireland's most haunted house. So there's two of those buried in here. Also, not scarily, the founding father of Canada is also buried in here. Uh, there's no ghost stories about him. He's just a, a nice guy by all accounts. <laughs> so if you just follow me down here. So this sarcophagus here, guys, this is a Templar sarcophagus. This was robbed back in the 15th century, so body and anything that was in it is gone. Now this is the opposite of that door up in Redmond's mausoleum. People often feel that this is hot or comforting. Now, will everyone shine their torches on this for me? Nope. I think I do it here, stroke. This is what we call the faceless one. This was put into place during the building of this place by its uh, contributor, Alexander De La Roche. Nobody knows who it is or why it's there. We do know that sometimes you can hear somebody saying, help me out of there. And also through this little church window here, you can actually see the church with the concave roof. So this here was where the uh, abbots and the monks in here would have prayed during the day. And then behind you here, this is St. Mary's Church. So if you just move over here, what are guys? We're not out of the graveyard yet. So on the way back out, sorry lads, no, this is really important. Please take your torch back out. And we go back up because I know from years ago we did we did a tour back here yeah. 12 years ago and it's always the way out where someone falls. Okay, so I just in the uh, the haunted Holly tour um, from uh, from Paul Walsh and Wexford Walks. I highly recommend it. I'm going to just uh, ask Paul a few questions and I want to have a few questions. Uh, I'm interested on some of his answers. So thanks Paul for the tour. I thought it was very, very informative and very, very well played out. What was the idea? Like, where did you get the idea to, to do the tour? Well, Mick, thanks very much for coming with me. So obviously I do the Wexford Walks, Wex Walks. Yep. We do the daytime history tour uh, five times a week. And also then I love tours. When I go to a city like Edinburgh or London or New York or San Francisco, the first thing I do is either the Red Bus tour or a walking tour. And yeah. when we went to Edinburgh in 2006, we went on the City of the Dead tour. So shout out to those guys because they're brilliant. Yeah. Okay. And if you're in Edinburgh, go to it. So basically we went on that tour and we went around and my one thought apart from this is brilliant is Wexford has everything that this place has and I just thought it would be a shame not to use the historical sites here in Wexford that we've been to tonight yeah. like Patrick's Church St John's Graveyard and of course Settis Grabby which is our backdrop here tonight very good and just like are you still involved with the lantern promotions and uh 
because I know you do the Santi the thing in the I'm Santi's very best friend yeah. You say, yeah you still do that and all that I do and, and uh, you're also have, a director I, and an actor yes and, I'm involved with extra drama group and I direct musicals and all that stuff so basically all this has kind of come together my love for history if I hadn't gotten into drama I would have gotten into history mm. and performance really comes together for me in Wexbox and the ultimate expression of that is the ghost tour because more than any of the other tours it's yeah. really a storytelling experience and I get to tell all these stories about Wexford not only is there ghost stories but there's a lot of history in it as well because history is more horrific than anything we can make <laughs> up as you know uh, so we talked a lot about different tortures and different murders and things like that uh, as we went along the tour tonight so it really is like a dream come true to be honest to, to be able to be paid for a job like this is just fantastic well, you're doing a fabulous job. I really appreciate it. I think it's good. So if you ever come to Wexford, make sure you look up. And I'll have Wexford, the link below. Wexford Wex, Walks. Wex Walks on Facebook, Instagram, uh, Twitter, Airbnb, or in the Bullring in Wexford. I'm there every single day, Wednesday, Thursday, Friday, Saturday, Sunday. I take Mondays and Tuesdays off. 086-213-8062. Very good. So make sure you make that part of your... Uh, your places to see when you come to Wexford and don't forget to uh, hit that bell button and subscribe to my channel if you're not subscribed because only 25% of my viewers are subscribers so please uh, do that it really helps with the algorithms and thanks again Paul for inviting me to Thank the you. store really good